just a verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the, the next chapter. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Let's bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We, we know that you wish us to be happy and joyful and your word shows us the path we are to take in life. Father, I understand that what I say is going to land in all sorts of different ways in different people's lives. Father, we pray that by your grace and by your Holy Spirit, you'll convince us of your truth and of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Um, we're, since Easter, some of you will know we've been thinking about the resurrection, that doctrine that Paul says is of first importance. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance that Christ died, that he was buried, that he was raised. So this doctrine of the resurrection is central to Christianity. In fact, it's unique to Christianity. That Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, that he was raised. This doctrine is of first importance. This doctrine, therefore, must be front and center of what we're to preach and teach. This is what the Christian church must insist upon. This is what we, as members of St. John's, must stand firm upon, firm on. That's not to say that other issues aren't important. Things like climate change, the plight of refugees, Putin's invasion of the Ukraine. Those are important issues. They devastate and ruin the lives of millions of people but they're not that important, which sounds shocking, I know. They're not that important. They're not of first importance. Because these issues, climate change, war, the plight of refugees, are issues of this present evil age. They're not issues that touch on heaven and hell, eternal life or eternal death. So the doctrine of the resurrection of the body of Jesus Christ of Nazareth is front and center. Lose this doctrine, says Paul, and you lose everything. You lose the faith, you embrace another religion altogether. And that's why we've been preaching on this doctrine more or less for well, ever since Easter. And we're doing so because the consequences downstream of that doctrine are huge, absolutely massive. Now, we must hold on to a distinction here. Richard Hooker once said that doctrine can be denied either directly or by consequence. In other words, you can deny a teaching for example, the resurrection of the body, by flatly contradicting it. Or you could deny that doctrine by ignoring a necessary corollary of it. Now, some doctrines are... Now, this, this will be... Well, it's new to me. It was new to me last week, so it's probably new to you. Some doctrines are trophic doctrines or cascading doctrines. Now... You say, what? What's a trophic doctrine? Well, actually, I made that up. Not the word trophic, but I made up the word trophic doctrine last week. Because uh, I never heard of trophic or cascading things, doctrines, until I heard, started to read about what ha what's been happening to Yellowstone National Park. Now, bear with me. This is connected. Have you been following, keeping up with what's happening to Yellowstone National Park? Shame on you. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. A few years ago, 
they decided to reintroduce wolves, a top predator, into the park. And people were amazed, astonished, just taken aback as to what happened. For in a very short space of time, almost the whole ecosystem of the park changed. It became, to all intents and purposes, a new park. You could say it was a park reborn. Yellowstone National Park was born again. You say, how? Well, the soil became aerated, valleys regenerated, trees grew to five times their previous height, birds started to flock back, bushes started to sprout berries, the bear population dramatically increased, beavers started to build dams which altered the course of rivers and provided habitats for muskrats, amphibians, ducks, fish, reptiles, and otters. The rabbits and mouse population skyrocketed. Um, Bald eagles started to return. Rivers started to flow fuller and faster as the riverbank stabilized. In short, everything changed. That's a terrific change. That's a cascading change. Which means that the change that occurred was of such a fundamental nature that everything in the park was reconfigured. Everything changed all the way down from top to bottom, from wolf to mouse. And when everything shifts like this, everything needs to be renegotiated. Um, because every relationship between each of the species in the Yellowstone Park is now not the same, so all that needed to be uh, renegotiated and come to terms with. And I thought, oh my goodness, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then I thought, yes, the resurrection of the body is a trophic doctrine. It's a, tr it's a cascading doctrine. Because Jesus' physical resurrection of the dead changed everything. Everything. Totally everything. From king to pauper. And because this doctrine is a trophic doctrine, it absolutely revolutionized the ancient world. Completely. Now, I'm always comforted. I'm always a bit nervous, uh, you know, when I, well, to Karen, I tell you, I'm always a bit nervous every Sunday morning before I'm about to preach, because I think, you know, what I say could really impact people's lives, and I don't want it just to be me, you know. So I was really comforted to think, to find out that I'm not the only one saying this, that this doctrine changed the ancient world. Tom Holland is also saying this. Now, I don't think he's even a Christian. But he is a tremendous historian of the ancient world. He's written on ancient Greece and Rome. He's written on Sparta. He's written on the Gallic Wars. And what he does in his books is he highlights the cruelty and vanity of ordinary men and women that that culture produced. And there came a point, he said, after studying the ancient world for 25 years. There came a point, he said, when he suddenly realized he did not like the cultures he was writing about. He just didn't like them. Or the people that inhabited the ancient world. And said, Tom Holland said, you know, I became disgusted, just disgusted at the casual cruelty of the ancient world that was on, on constant, incessant display everywhere in the arena in the way Roman emperors would sell millions of people into slavery and just think nothing of it. I mean, they go to bed at night and sleep like babies. In the way, he says this, any Roman male in any position of power could casually use, casually use, almost any girl or any woman or any inferior boy or man, he could casually use them at any moment as a mere receptacle for his passion. He thought that was disgusting. Or the way it was possible, said Tom Holland, that millions of children, millions of children, toddlers, could be thrown out onto the rubbish tips of the empire only to be eagerly harvested by pimps and sold into a lifetime 
of sexual slavery. Think of those children. How was it possible? Tom Holland asked that one be human being so, could so degrade and shame the body of another human being. And then he thought, for goodness sake, what changed all this? How come we're not doing that today? What happened to the ancient world that we now look back in the ancient world and think that's awful? And as Tom Holland began to think about this, it dawned on him that all the human relationships in the empire were reshaped not only vertically between emperor and slave, but also horizontally between men and women. He said, this suddenly changed. He said, well, what changed that? And he began to say, what changed that was the Apostle Paul. He said, it's amazing, isn't it? He said, the Apostle Paul burst onto the ancient world and he began to travel and to preach and to write and to say things like, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality. Boom. But for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. That's another bomb going off. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he'll raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Notice the emphasis on the body. The importance of the body, the resurrection of the body, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has its offshoot into this area of sexual morality. Because Paul says the body is not meant for sexual immorality. The body is meant for the Lord. The Lord is for the body. God raised the body from the dead and you'll raise our bodies also. Your body is a member of Christ's body. Shall I take my body, which belongs to Christ's body, and unite it with the body of a prostitute? Impossible. Now, as I say, well, Tom Holland says this, this is totally revolutionary. Totally revolutionary. No one, it's, a, it's difficult for us to imagine this, no one in the history of the world had ever heard anything like this. Ever. Holland claims that this sort of writing, this sort of teaching, this vision of the world was like putting a depth charge under the structural foundations of the pagan world, and when that depth charge went off, everything was changed and upended, and nothing was ever the same again. That's why the ancient world changed, says Holland, because of the Apostle Paul. So what were these depth charges that went off? Now, my goodness, you know, I haven't got enough time, really. So I'm just going to mention two things. One thing's going to be quite long, the other thing's going to be quite short. I could go on for, well, days, but I won't. The first depth charge that went off was simply this. The first depth charge completely changed, the, shattered the ancient world's take on the human body. That's really important to grasp. And you can see how Paul engages with this in his epistle. Remember, he's writing to the church in Corinth. It's very important to bear that in mind. This is the letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthian, Corinth was a city in which paganism had taken such deep root that Rome herself was shocked. Because Corinth pushed everything to its logical conclusion. Corinth had a history that stretched back way before the Trojan Wars, and yet 200 years previously it had completely been raised to the ground and had been completely rebuilt. So, in effect, Corinth was a new city where everything was new. And get this, everybody was trying to establish their identity. Okay? Everybody was trying to establish their identity and make their way in life. Because in Corinth, such a young city, there were no established traditions, no established families, no established order, and that produced a deep radicalism. I mean, just to give you an outlandish example, there was a philosopher, a Greek philosopher called Diogenes, who set up shop in Corinth, and what he did is he lived in a jar and um, stark naked, and he engaged in lewd public sexual acts in front of everybody, and everybody just took that in their stride, just thought that was normal. Moreover, the city of Corinth was a city dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite, which meant that on the Acropolis outside the city was a pagan temple dedicated to the goddess of love, 
which meant that every evening thousands of male and female prostitutes would descend into the city and ply their trade. And in that city, they had certain slogans. Now, we've got slogans today, don't we? We've got, my body, my choice. That's a slogan. We say, love is love. That's a slogan. We say, make love, not war. That's a slogan. I heard a new slogan, God is gay. So these are just slogans. People go around saying them. But behind the slogans is a deep philosophical understanding of the nature of the world. And so in Corinth, their slogans were, I have the right to do anything. That's right, it sounds very familiar, doesn't it? I have the right to do anything. That's a slogan in Corinth. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. That was another slogan. Behind that, there's a whole world of meaning, but that was their slogan. They said also, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. That's another slogan. And you think, for goodness sake, what does all that mean? Well, give me a minute. When the Corinthians said, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, they were saying, what were they saying? What was behind that slogan? Well, they were simply saying is, sex is like food. Right? Sex is like food. It's an appetite. It's good. Uh, without food, you'll die. Without sex, you'll die. Was their thinking. So if you're hungry, what do you do when you're hungry? Eat. What do you do if you want sex? Well, have it. Right? It's no big deal. Because eating and drinking, satisfying your desires, is the most natural thing in the world. What, what, what are all these hang-ups about? Because your body is natural, isn't it? It's got natural, it's of the flesh, it's got natural instincts. So do what you want with your body. It's my right, it's my body. I can do whatever I like with my body. It belongs to you. One day your body will die. There's no resurrection of the dead. Your body's not important. And that's so, that view is so prevalent today, isn't it? Really prevalent. Many, many people think like this, that your body is just a material thing, that it's, it's a material thing, it's got certain, certain needs, those needs must be satisfied. To deny those instincts or to repress those instincts is harmful, psychologically damaging. Just as damaging as if you refuse to eat, that would be damaging too. But alongside that view was another view. What was that one? It goes like this. It's good not to touch a woman. And you think, hang on a second, the ancient world's confused here. And of course it was confused. They were saying, on the one hand, express your natural instincts. On the other hand, don't touch. Well, which is it? Well, it all depends on how they, it all boils down to how they define the body. Because all, both sides agreed, those who said it's just an appetite, those who were saying don't touch, all, all, both sides agreed that the body was just a physical, natural thing. So the one side said, we'll give in to it. The other side said, hold back. And if you ask the question, well, why should you hold back? They would say, because the body is just a natural physical thing, that means it's bad. Right? Because the body's bad. It's material. It's not spiritual. So you shouldn't touch a woman. Because that's giving in to your natural desires and the body is wicked, the body is evil, because the body isn't really you. Okay, who are you? Ah, oh. you are you who you define inside, you see. So who you really are has got nothing to do with your body. So to be spiritual, you've got to back off from doing physical things with your body. And so what you need is to develop your inner spiritual life, not give in to your material body. Now, I should say this, I mean, even Christians were duped by this. One early church father went so far as to have himself castrated and to make himself sterile because he was wanting to deny the body, which... 
some people are doing today, in effect, making themselves sterile. And so here comes, that was, the, that was their thinking, and then here comes St. Paul, and he says, flee sexual immorality. Which means what exactly? Well, notice what he's saying. He's not saying flee, flee sex. He's not saying that at all. He's saying run away from sexual immorality. Um, flee from sexual immorality. And then he goes to talk on, he starts to talk about prostitutes. Well, okay. He would do in Corinth, of course, because they're everywhere. Um, they're on every street corner and everybody's being engaged with them. But when he's talking about prostitutes, he's talking about sex with single people because prostitutes were the only single people, in effect, in Corinth because all the women were locked away, they were like the Vestal Virgins, locked away in the houses, in the homes, and weren't available. So what Paul is saying when he's saying flee sexual immorality, don't have sex with prostitutes, he's saying do not have sex with a person you're not married to. And then if you said to Paul, okay, Paul, why can't I indulge in a relationship with someone to whom I'm not married? And Paul would say, because when you do, you're becoming one flesh, one body with that person. Where did Paul get that idea from? Of course, he got that idea from what God said way back in the Garden of Eden when God made man, when God took the dust of the ground and structured Adam and he made his eyes and feet and hands and sinews and nails and hair and reproductive organs and he became, as it were, a glorious piece of art. There he is, a body, a structured, coherent physical body and then what does God do? God breathes his breath into that body, the very breath of God. And we're told that Adam became a living soul. And so now he's both body and soul. He's a living, breathing, integrated being of body and spirit, flesh and soul, a physical entity, a spiritual entity. In short, he becomes what? A whole person. A whole person. So now it's almost impossible, in fact, it is impossible to separate out in an individual person their body from their soul and to say that the body is not somehow not the real you. Can't do that. Because God has breathed into your body. So you can't say, it's impossible to say to anyone, this person is not a person. This person is not worthy of respect. This person is not, this person can be discarded. This person can be placed on a rubbish tip. This person can become a slave. This person can be gassed. This person can be aborted. Can't say that. Because it's a whole person, body and soul. And then God did something else. He took Adam and he wounded him. Just as Christ was wounded in his side, Adam is wounded in his side. And from his side, God does what? He takes flesh and blood. He takes bone and he structures Eve. So that Eve likewise becomes a body and a soul, a unity, a whole living, integrated being, also made in the image of God. And so she's both at the one and the same time, notice this, guys, she's both at the one and the same time, both like Adam and yet radically unlike. Amazing, isn't it? She is her own unique person, body and soul. Herman Barbic, the Dutch theologian, when he wrote about all this, wrote this, and I'll, I'll read it slowly, but get your mind around this. When God made humankind, he created it so that in both Adam and Eve, one and the same life, one and the same breath, flows throughout their bodies and operates and manifests itself in every organ in a manner peculiar to that organ. And when God saw that, what did he say? He said, it is good. 
It is very, very good. So what's God saying? Listen to this. Being female is good. It is good to be a female. Let me press this on you, if I may. Are you, are you a female this morning? God is saying, I have made you. Look at the body I've given you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your body, your body, is carrying an imprinted message from me, says God. That message leaches down into your soul so that you cannot separate yourself from your body. Your body is a declaration. Being female is not toxic. Your body is created by me, says God. I designed it that way. It's patterned for a purpose, an end, a goal. And secondly, God is also saying being male is good. And that seems almost like a radical thing to say today. Being male is good. It is good to be male. And so if you're a male this morning, God is saying to you, I've made you. Look at the body I've given you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your body is carrying an imprinted message from me that leaches down into your soul so that you cannot separate your soul from your body. Your body is a declaration. Being male is not toxic. Your body is created by me. I designed it that way. It's patterned for a purpose, an end, a goal. It is not better to be female. Oh my goodness. Isn't this what our culture so desperately needs to hear? Desperately needs to hear it. Because people are looking at their bodies and they're despising their bodies. They hate their bodies. They don't realize that their bodies are gifts to them from God. And so when they despise their body, basically they're accusing God of doing a thing that was not good. And so when Paul says that when a man and woman come together, they became one flesh, do you see the implications of this? When you become flesh, one flesh, he says, do not think that it's just your two bodies that are becoming one. So are your minds. So are your souls, because God so designed sex, there's not just a physical coupling, it's a giving over of your whole self to the other person. Which means you may think, you may think, that you're just giving over your body, but you're not. You're not, says Paul. And that's why Paul says, you must flee from this, because if you're not careful, you might be thinking, well, God just wants me to be unhappy. It's not that. What God is saying, what Paul is saying is, if you're not careful, this will destroy you. This will shred your soul. This will shred your life. This can wreck your emotions. Now, all of you know this, I think. Some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Because there may be some of you, and I don't want to be sexist, but in my life, I've experienced it's normally girls and women who I've been talking to who, where this has happened. Where they give, they've given themselves over to the other person. Physically, they just give themselves over. Complete self-donation. Only to discover that their partner wasn't doing the same. The partner was just using them. And do you know what that created? Do you know what that creates? Deep loneliness, trauma, rejection. To feel that you've given yourself over to another person only to discover that a person was just using you as a receptacle is a horrible, terrible thing. It's deep trauma. But then, of course, perhaps you're, you're on the other side of the equation. And perhaps you thought you could just give yourself physically to the other person and yet hold on to the real you. Well, I'm just giving you my body, but I'm going to hold on to it, my emotions. I'm going to hold on to my independence. Well, I've talked to blokes as well who've done this. And what they discover over time as this becomes an established pattern in their life is that they become very bitter, very hard, and very cruel. And it changes them. It shreds them. And it comes to a point where so many of my male friends who've done this have not, at the end of the day, ever been able to get married. 
because they can't do that anymore. They can't commit on that level. Marriage is too much of a challenge. And so that's why Paul says, this sin is not like other sins. This sin is against your own body. This goes all the way down. Right? This will destroy you. This will go into your soul in such a way that you will not be able to love as you are created to love. That's the first depth charge. I mean, that boom. The Roman Empire has come, trump, has come tumbling down now, but that depth charge is combined with another depth charge, and I'll be really short on this. Um, remember, he's been saying free sexual immorality, not sex. He's been saying free sexual immorality. And in chapter 7, that's where Paul starts to develop his doctrine of marriage. And he goes on to say that it's in marriage that is the one arena in which both male and female, a biological and complementary pair, are able to say to each other, I belong totally and exclusively, exclusively to you, which is what we say every time in the marriage service, isn't it? I will, in marriage preparation, I really stress this. Listen to this. I give you this ring as a sign of our marriage. With my body, I honor you. Okay, we've got that. We've got that. Just the body? No. All that I am, all that I am, I give to you. All that I have, I share with you within the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. With my body, yes, but also my soul, my spirit, my heart, whatever I possess, my money, possessions, properties, land, effects, I'm holding nothing back. This is a complete free giving, not just of my body, but of my whole person. And you see, it's so important we grasp this because if you use sex in any other context, you'll begin to undermine marriage and destabilize society. Maybe I'll finish with an illustration, which I hope brings us out. In the Middle, in the Middle Ages, there was a village surrounded by deep forests that were thick with wolves. And it was agreed that if, if ever a villager was about to be attacked, he was to cry, wolf, wolf. And the whole village would rush out to help. But only if he was about to be killed by a wolf. You could only use that wolf, wolf at that point. Well, one day a young boy goes out and he gets lonely and he feels lost. So he cries out, wolf, wolf, and the whole village pours out, only to find him sitting quite happily on a log. And he said, well, why, why did you cry wolf, wolf? He said, well, I was lonely. And they said, no, 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 if you use that signal, that distress call for anything else apart from the use for which it was created, you're going to endanger the whole village. It'll become meaningless. It'll become cheapened. And Paul's saying the same thing is true of sex in any other context apart from marriage. Two depth charges, a reconfigured view of the body, a reshaped understanding of marriage. My friends, I know some of you might have struggled with this. I'd be happy to talk with you about it if you want, if you feel that would be helpful. But Paul's doing this in order to bring joy and happiness and stability to a society that is desperately confused and very miserable. Let's bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've heard this morning. We recognize, Father, that your word is challenging and difficult. Father, we pray that you'll give us the grace to embrace it and hold fast to it. We thank you for the resurrection of the body. We thank you that you've put such stress on who we are, both soul, spirit, and body. In Jesus' name, amen.